The SACP is currently briefing the media following its central committee plenary uh, after the local government elections. Let's take a listen in. pushes auctioning off the broad spectrum with no mention of a set aside for the state to pioneer national development imperatives so that government can be able to fulfill its constitutional obligations including ensuring national security we call on the minister of finance to revise this problematic stance the key task facing the SACP and the working class from now on is to intensify the struggle on two fronts, as we have said, against neoliberalism and its policy regime, not least its agenda of austerity, as well as state ca capture networks, which are characterized by rampant corruption. We are saying that the SACP and the working class will continue to expose and tackle deception by neoliberal elements as well. What is of concern to us as well is that those who are pushing for neoliberal methods, they do this on the grounds that they are fighting state capture. We are saying you can't fight state capture with neoliberal methods because at the end of the day, the net impact of these two types of activities is actually the impoverishment of the working class and enriching the already very wealthy in society. The SACP will also push for the development and expansion of the publicly owned economic sector to take care of the material needs of the people. The working class needs to unite behind the strategic imperative and to defend the publicly owned economic sector against neoliberal and state capture agendas. Joint action by the progressive trade union movement remains essential. As a matter of fact, the Central Committee said the SACP must prioritize supporting joint actions by the trade unions across federations to fight common battles. They can't afford to be divided when the capitalist bosses are united in making profits at all costs. The SACP will strengthen its efforts and engagements with the progressive trade union movement in this regard to make sure that workers pursue their common interests. Convening a joint summit of the progressive trade union movement is an imperative and can contribute positively to taking this proposal of building worker unity forward. In the same manner, the Central Committee tasked the Politburo and the Secretariat of the SACP to initiate a process to convene a conference of left forces. This action is in line with the SACP's resolution to build a popular left front. The conference of the left should reflect on the multiple crises facing South Africa, the persistent high rates of growing unemployment, poverty, inequality, and the associated crises of families struggling to make ends meet, as well as this conference of the left must focus on what is to be done with regards to the energy crisis and the climate change crisis that is facing us. This, we hope, will serve as a platform to expand consultation on a joint program of action and mobilization. As the SACP, we are saying, we've been arguing for our own policy perspectives in front of the televisions for too long now. It's time really for more action. Not that we have not taken action in the past, like we have done with the financial sector and with land issues. But we want to intensify this by broadening and bringing together the forces that have got a common interest with us in realizing the defeat of both the state capture agenda and the neoliberal agenda. On the just energy transition, the SACP invited Comrade Barbara Chrissy in her capacity as the Minister of Forestry, Fisheries and Environmental Affairs. She made a very good presentation on the environment, climate change, and a just green transition. The minister also briefed the Central Committee about the outcomes of COP26, the Conference of Parties on the Environment and Climate Change that was recently held in Scotland. The SACP commits to support the progressive thrust 
of the government's program on this front towards achieving net zero carbon emissions whilst also mobilizing progressive forces on the ground. But at the same time, the Central Committee said, we must not allow developed countries to set an agenda on climate change that simply suits them and at the expense of developing countries. Investment in ESCOM, uh, state capacity in the renewable power generation capacity, and building social ownership in energy provision is a key imperative for a just transition. Putting profit-seeking interests before the people using energy as a community will only result in unjust practices. Doing so will condemn the state to a procurer exposed to the whims of the private wealth accumulation market. Energy will not be produced to serve the people if it is privatized, and it will not advance national development imperatives. In short, and to put this simply, renewables, for instance, in energy must not be the exclusive preserve of the private sector. ESCOM and communities must actually be involved in the areas of energy and renewable energy, so that this is not just like a private sector driven thing. Protecting workers and creating alternative employment must be part of what is called the just transition. Any transition that will cause misery through retrenchments, amongst others, and leaving ghost towns behind will be unjust. Also important, while considering international development, South Africa must plan the transition from the standpoint of our national priorities and our challenges. On the unemployment crisis, unemployment rose in the third quarter of 2021 by 0.5% to 34.9%, affecting 7.6 million active unemployed work seekers. Looking at the total picture represented by the ex what is known as the expanded definition, South African unemployment crisis is worse than is depicted by the officially preferred narrow definition. It is a disastrous 46.6%, having increased by 2.2% in the third quarter of 2021. This affects approximately 12.9 million active and discouraged work seekers. This monumental disaster needs to be understood in all its dimensions, including race, gender, age, and geography. In this way, South Africa will inform its interventions in a much better way. Just to explain this, unfortunately, and but scandalous, near 30 years after our democratic breakthrough, unemployment is strongly marked by racial and gendered features. African unemployment is at a shocking 51.1%. That is amongst the African people. Unemployment among all women is at 55.1% compared to 42% for men. Youth unemployment is a catastrophic 77.4% for those aged between 15 to 24 and 55.3% for those aged 25 to 34 years. Geographically, the worst unemployment levels are in rural areas. The former Bantu stands are the hardest hit. They still resemble their status under apartheid as labor reservoirs for monopoly capital and productive activity in metropolitan areas. In the former Bantustan areas, for instance, there is no industrial development and notable job opportunities. There is little, if any at all, opportunities for sustainable livelihoods in these former Bantustan areas. You can smell poverty in the Bantustan areas, in particular in the form of understanding areas. Policies aimed at addressing the unemployment crisis must also be aimed at achieving transformation in terms of race, in terms of gender and youth, and also to prioritize rural development so that we roll back uneven development and unequal distribution of investment and resources. On social policy and public employment programs, Governmental timidity or worse still short-sighted austerity is simply unacceptable. When government introduced the COVID-19 social relief 
grant mm -hmm. of a meager 350 rands to assist those aged between 18 to 59 who do not receive any social grant. There were over 9.5 million applications. This just shows the level of, of desperation in our society. Some 6.5 million of these applications were eventually approved. Mega as it is, a certain level of relief nevertheless. But now the medium term budget policy statement has announced that this extremely small grant will be terminated at the end of March. This will have the effect of leaving the millions of unemployed sinking deeper into deprivation and destitution with no alternatives amidst the worsening unemployment crisis and the economic impact of the emerging fourth wave of COVID-19. It is imperative that the widest range of working class and popular forces actively mobilize in the coming period for the social relief distress, distress grant to be extended at least beyond March and that the amount is significantly increased and that this becomes a first and rapid step towards establishing a universal basic income grant and the establishment of a comprehensive social security system. By the way, there is no contradiction and also there is no choice between the social relief grant and provision of money for education and skills development in order to empower especially young people to be able to make sustainable livelihoods for themselves. Both things need to be done. And some of the immediate intervention, intervention should include scaling up of public employment programs, both to provide relief against unemployment and to expand the provision of skills development. Public employment programs will contribute positively towards establishing the right to work in our country. The SACP is going to be throwing everything into calling for and supporting and actively encouraging government to provide public employment programs. Because there are so many things that need to be done in our communities that require public employment programs, like cleaning of our township and villages and providing of social and economic structures in our townships and villages. All those are important platforms for public employment programs. On taking forward the fight against COVID-19, we wish to salute, as the SACP, the work of South African scientists through genomic surveillance. This work has helped and even provided leadership to the entire world in identifying new variants of COVID-19. The Central Committee denounced the imperialists and other governments that have shut the borders of their countries against entry by South African and Southern African people. As if, by the way, the Omicron variant of COVID-19 originated in Southern Africa. The fact of the matter is that the spread of this virus right now is global. And in fact, the new variant may have come from anywhere in the world including from outside the African continent. This assumption that this came from the African continent is wrong. And in any case, you are closing the borders after the fact. And I feel like this time using, sorry for the language, the best description of what the advanced countries are doing. That they think they're going to have vaccines, vaccinate their populations, and leave the developing world to see for itself and hope to defeat COVID-19 and hope that they will close their borders. That won't work. According to a, a colleague of ours and a comrade of ours from the Communist Party of the United States of America, he said such an approach, it's like all of you, we are, we are in the swimming pool having a nice swim, and then having a corner of the swimming pool being reserved for those who want to pee. That's what is actually happening. In the face of this situation, the SACP calls on all our people, nevertheless, to go out to vaccinate in numbers as the best way to fight against this deadly virus, whilst also at the same time maintaining the health protocols of physical distancing, uh, washing our hands, using sanitizers, and wearing our masks. 
The SICP calls upon government to urgently also resolve the matter of medicines acquired by the South African National Defense Force from Cuba. The South African Health Regulatory Authority, the Central Committee said, must stop making statements on this matter of Cuban medicines to the South African National Defense Force. Must stop making statements that are insensitive, that in fact border on recklessness, and make their statements come across as if SAPRA is imposing a second blockade on Cuba after the United States. To actually say we're going to go and, 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 and impound these medicines and destroy them is offensive to the majority of the people of South Africa. That's not the role of a regulatory agency or any other agency of the state. We have diplomatic relations with the Cubans who sacrifice their lives to make sure that we have a democratic South Africa today. The Central Committee said we must communicate this statement very strongly. It doesn't take kindly to this. On international situation and solidarity, the SACP expressed its concern about situations of instability in the Southern African region. Besides political and economic challenges in Lesotho, Zimbabwe, Swaziland, and Mozambique, the SACP is concerned about what seems to be an impending instability in Botswana. The tensions between the current president, President Masisi, and former president of Botswana, Ian Khama, pose a serious problem of instability in that country, if not watched carefully. We are also concerned that the South African Reserve Bank seems to be unfairly implicated in funds allegedly stolen in Botswana. We know that this is not the case and it must be corrected. SADC, we're calling upon it to pay close attention to this developing situation in Botswana so that it does not lead to instability. Our region cannot afford any more instability, and least South Africa, by the way, because every area of instability in the SADC region has got huge implications for South Africa in particular. We are calling for the intervention also, led by SADC, to be intensified in Swaziland, especially the establishment of inclusive dialogue processes amongst all political formations. This, we say, must be expedited so that a negotiated transition to democracy is realized in Swaziland. The SACP also denounces the call made by imperialist countries to boycott the Beijing Winter Olympics in China, ostensibly as part of the new Cold War waged by the United States on China. This is all because of China's impressive economic growth and development that is advancing to surpass the United States economy. The SACP wishes to pledge its solidarity with the people of Sudan in their struggle for democracy, the people of Western Sahara in their struggle against occupation by Morocco, and the people of Palestine against occupation by the apartheid re Israeli regime. We also reiterate our solidarity with Cuba and saying that Cuba has a right to pursue its own economic program. Also our solidarity to the Venezuelan people, the Bolivian people, and Nicaragua against US-led imperialist aggression. We welcome the re-emerging re consolidation of and advances by left and progressive forces in Latin America, including in countries like Peru, Honduras, and Chile. This underlines our point that neoliberalism is not the solution, but the cause of the problems and challenges faced by the workers and poor in the world. Increasingly, the people of Latin America are rejecting this neoliberal program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jesus. Let me invite questions uh, from our media colleagues. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, 
When you look and you speak about what you term the unholy alliances in the minority governments within the metros, still today no governments have been formed in these metros. There are no MMCs. What needs to be done in order for these metros to have effective governments being constituted by the coalitions that have been formed that will service the people. Secondly, <clears throat> your statement speaks of the IFP. As a former student in northern KwaZulu Town, Mr. Zimande, as someone who's worked with uh, many ANC leaders in that province to change the electoral fortunes of your governing party within that province, what does it mean when you see the resurgence? of the IFP and particularly with the plan that they had to have an entire blockade of the northern provinces by taking all the district municipalities and local municipalities in order to launch an offensive to take over the province. As someone who's worked in ANC structures in that province, what does the local, the recent local government results mean for the future of that province of KwaZulu Natal? And then lastly, you speak about this unity and lack of cohesion within the governing party. This has been pretty much in your statements for the past six or seven years. Is the ANC just simply irreparable and can't have any cohesion and must just simply implode? Thank you. Thank you, Tears. Uh, Should I go ahead? Yes. Yeah, some good. We knew that you always fire salvos, you know. <laughs> but that's your job. We respect that. Uh, <coughs> precisely, the point we are raising about the failure of these minority governments in the metros to form a government underlines the point we are saying. It's a sign already that there's going to be huge instability because it's, it's minority governments that are not forced on principles. They are based on an anti-ANC platform. Instead of being based on uniting for provision of services and changing the circumstances of the workers and the poor of our country. It also shows the extent to which, of course, there's been fragmentation in the voting of the people, and we have explained partly the non-voting as well, non-voting bloc, that has led us to this unfortunate situation. On our side, we are saying where we are the opposition, the ANC and its alliance partners, we must watch the situations there very closely, and we must have mass-based opposition, not for the sake of oppositionism, but to point out what is it that needs to be done correctly? That is going to be our responsibility. If you ask me what is to be done, that's going to be our responsibility. But we are in for a rocky period. There is no doubt about that because there is no principle. We have never had a party saying our whole aim of participating in the election was to dislodge the ANC. What kind of a program is that? A negative program. So the result is what we are seeing now. Unfortunately, such instability means worse for the ordinary people of our country who desperately need services. My comrades will add uh, on this. Uh, on the resurgence of the IFP, it's a sad development because, by the way, the ANC had made and its allies huge advances in KZN. 2019 and even in 2016, by the way. As the only party, really, that is capable, the African National Congress, of pursuing a progressive agenda. But again, largely, if we are to be honest, we need to be self-critical. The ANC needs to be self-critical in KZN. 
together and its allies as to the reasons why we've actually lost so much ground. And it's a reflection of the problems that we've actually said. Factionalism, deep internal divisions, marginalization of the alliance, and we've already, we have always, you are right, been warning as the SACP, that those of our comrades in the ANC who think that the ANC can make advances by alienating its allies, the SACP and COSATO, are wrong. They must disabuse themselves of that. Partly of what we are seeing is precisely this. But also we are saying is that there is an, an economic interest that has been growing inside the structures of the ANC as well. What we call a bureaucratic and parasitic petty bourgeoisie, which is capturing municipal budgets for purposes of personal accumulation. We must face that. KZN also partly is a result of that because with that happening, there's been very poor provision of services. We must take to heart the message that is from our people. And we know these problems. The NC itself has said it, by the way, which is good in its own assessment, you know. Let me just tell you one example. For me, some guy, when I was campaigning, I'm sorry if I'm, I'm taking long. It was in my hometown, in an area which is predominantly working class Indian community. They point, they point a building you know, which is like the size of two RDP houses. They say, this is the third municipal campaign now. We are coming, over the past 10 years, we are coming to us to say we must vote for you. Look at that building. We have asked the municipality not to build, to demolish that building. In 10 years, the municipality can't demolish, let alone building, just to demolish that building. Now, those are some of the things that must be there's nothing as easy as demolished to billies. Now, those are some of the things we must accept as a movement. And that moving forward, we must not allow those things to happen. Those are some of the things that have cost us in KZN. Otherwise, how do you explain the advances we make before? And also, there's been a certain level of arrogance on our side in the movement and the distance that has begun to develop between ourselves and the people. That's what renewal must address. That's why we're saying we are supporting this effort of the ANC on, on renewal, which links to your last question. Is the ANC irreparable? We don't believe that the ANC is irreparable. But there is a huge challenge, a huge challenge. That's what we're discussing in leading this renewal. That is why also we are saying this renewal must not just be moralistic. It must be very concrete. How do we defeat factions? In fact, as the movement, we might as well accept that there can't be unity between the ANC and thieves who are hiding inside the African National Congress and our alliance. There can't be unity between those. Part of the renewal is to build a new cadership in our movement that is actually committed to addressing the interests of the people. We haven't lost hope. That is why we are saying, coming out of the Central Committee, one of the key challenges is to rebuild an ANC that has got confidence of the people. And we are calling on all communists and the workers in this country. Go into the structures of the ANC in your own right as members of the African National Congress and reclaim this movement. You know, let, let me just give you another example, Samgele, why we believe not only is that the ANC is not repairable, but why we need the ANC? This country need an, needs an ANC, a broad movement capable of uniting the widest range of forces behind building a non-racial, non-sexist, pro prosperous South Africa. All these other political parties, none of them are committed to that agenda. If you look at the DA, for example, the DA is fighting and uniting minority interests in the white Indian and colored communities out of fear of the African majority. They don't have a vision of building a non-racial and a better South Africa. And you need an ANC. Of course, you need a different ANC than where it is now in many of its structures. I don't know if my comrades would like to add on this. That's fine. Let me take uh, the follow-up question. Yes, Mr. Zivane, in fact, 
we are from Hertzberg in plain Zulu Liboli in the land of hope. But to to go further <laughs> to go <laughs> further, your, your statement speaks about the vaccines which were purchased in Cuba by the former Minister of Defense, <coughs> now the Speaker of Parliament, Mr. Zimbabwe, and how you speak Antiviral. of some uh, no imposing mm -hmm. its views and a second blockade in Cuba. But you can sit there, Mr. Zimbabwe, and read that statement all you want. But you sit in Cabinet, your own President of the country and of the governing party, has said nothing about vaccines from Cuba. In fact, he has gone even further with his administration. No vaccine from any of the BRICS countries is currently being rolled out in this country. We are seeing Western vaccines. Pfizer and Johnson and Johnson. Your own administration has had no confidence in the Cuban vaccines. So why defend a vaccine where you can't even persuade government to go and procure, and procure it? Thank you. Yes, uh, uh, GS, can I ask uh, Comrade Mobila to take this yes. question? And uh, I will rest yes. for a moment. <laughs> And uh, now, now Alex is deploying. <laughs> no, uh, so okay. uh, <clears throat> you are very hot today. Uh, but thank you very much for that. Look, firstly, we think that uh, government really has to change its strategy on the utilization of uh, available vaccines. Cuba also has got a vaccine. But this medication we are talking about is not a vaccine. It was an available antiviral medication uh, before COVID-19 vaccine was developed in the world. And it has been used extensively in the world in places like Italy, uh, Spain, Germany, China, Mexico, and other places. Uh, which, of course, it was important that uh, our defense was able to procure the medication in order to, to protect its soldiers, who were also being deployed in the front line in the fight against uh, COVID-19, particularly to enforce the lockdown measures. Therefore, then you have got a problem regarding how SAPRA managed that. But not only uh, this medication, there are several other medications of importance. Uh, for instance, Cuba has even won international awards on this medication, even from um, a World Health Organization. Medication that cures sugar diabetes. We've got a serious crisis of sugar diabetes in this country. We amputate people. They've got medication that can stop amputation of people. Mm. We've provided the health department in the past even with figures of amputations in our hospitals, that can be stopped almost as soon as it is possible. They just don't care because it's medication from Cuba at the expense of our people. There was SAPRA and other such institutions, while they're playing an independent role uh, in our country, unfortunately, from outside you can see that they actually carry out the mandate <coughs> of Big Pharma, of uh, Western countries. The first vaccine on COVID-19 to be produced was Sputnik V from Russia. Uh, it has not been allowed for use in this country. You know what's the reason? In the main, which is a lie, they say uh, it has got this uh, enzyme called a a a AFD5, which is apparently immunosuppressant. And because South Africans, there's too much prevalence of HIV and AIDS, Therefore, it cannot be used in this country, as if the majority of South Africans are HIV positive. This is completely nonsensical and unacceptable, particularly from a perspective of science. Then the, the, the Russians from the Gamalia Institute, a very reputable institute that over the years have even developed the first vaccines against Ebola, for instance. They then developed Sputnik Light, which doesn't have that so-called uh, uh, that uh, uh, immunosuppressant, they still can't qualify it. It was the first, in fact, they use Western medication, these vaccines, in this country on clinical trials, when actually Sputnik, having passed or peer-reviewed by Lancet, had already passed all scientific measurements 
or scientific uh, uh, requirements as a vaccine, they never utilized it. So it's quite clear uh, SAPRA has become a problem and we'll have to take a fight against these problematic tendencies. Because as you are, you are, you are correctly saying, not only the, from BRICS countries, of course, yes, China's got multiple vaccines. Some of them, they are even available for us to use for free. Before we had enough of so-called uh, vaccines from these Western countries, which vaccines are now going to be imposed on our people? Our people must have the, the, the right to choose even what kind of vaccines they want to use. For instance, although I vaccinated with this Western medication, I had wanted to use the Sputnik, for instance, or even Soberona from Cuba, but the Sputnik was made fa first. They didn't allow it to be used here. China vaccine, Sinopharm, Sinovac, and so forth, they've got multiple vaccines, but they've closed the borders uh, for these vaccines in this, in, in this country. And I think, ultimately, we may have to require a forensic investigation on how they've allocated these vaccines as compared to how they've rejected other vaccines, particularly from non-Western countries or uh, non-capitalist uh, uh, countries, for instance. That's, that's, that's the main thing. But of course, government will have to, to respond effectively to this and not only think that it is this institution. Because sometimes we, we, we give too much faith in this institution in the name of uh, pursuing our democracy. And we think that they will do good and then these institutions are captured by Western interests, not by the interests of the South African people. That's the thing that we'll have to resolve. So it has nothing to do, per se, for instance, with uh, uh, individually the presence of Comrade Nzimande in government. But we have called for government overall to create and build capacity to develop our own vaccines as a country. By the moment, vaccines that are here, they should not be discriminated on the basis of where they come from. Science is science. It's the same thing like we are discriminating. All right, that is the SSCP's uh, Central Committee plenary outcomes. We apologize. We seem to have uh, lost uh, the visuals uh, there, but certainly the sound coming out still. Uh, we're talking about uh, quite a few issues here. The SSCP raising at this particular point uh, the issue of vaccines coming to the fore. And we'll certainly catch up with uh, our senior reporter, Samkele Maseko, who, as you saw, is uh, in that audience at this time, uh, taking a listen to what's been discussed uh, by the SACP. We'll certainly be talking about the outcomes uh, of the plenary, um, the plenary committee meeting as well as uh, the issue of factionalism which was uh, dis uh, spoken about by the SACP Secretary General Blade in Zamande saying that that is one of the main reasons or the contributing factor to the ANC doing uh, not as well as they would have hoped during the local government election uh, results. And the SACP also lambasting the closing of borders by advanced nations. So a number of issues we then have to discuss uh, with our senior reporter as soon as we're able to get him out of uh, that meeting and have a chat with him. Uh, let's get